Okay, everybody, welcome back to Bright Minded with DJ Emu, live with Miley. Um, I spent the last I spent the last week applying some of the advice and the pointers that I got from the past guests, like Chef Max's methods, how to waste less in the kitchen, thinking about Zion and his motto, no excuses on days that I wanted to bail on my planks and push-ups and crunches. I thought about Alicia Keys and Lily Reinhardt and how they've been getting creative at this time. So I got out my journal and uh, started writing, which felt really, really good. I attempted Jeremy Scott's repurposed fashion project, which turns out is a great way to make DIY face masks. That's super important for keeping us all safe and um, healthy and protected, um, keeping ourselves safe, keeping others safe. So it was really cool to actually be able to take his idea and uh, kind of reinvent it for the current times that we're in. So I made some DIY face masks. Um, it's really, really important. So you know that I like to start the show with some good news. It seems that it gets drowned out in all the noise. And so I like to have a moment where the good news can really take the stage for a moment. So starting with countries around the world are starting to see the curve flatten. This means that cases are either becoming stable or declining and some countries in Asia and Europe are starting to lift restrictions on their lockdowns. But while this is good news, we still have a long way to go. Any lifting of restrictions is happening cautiously and slowly. And here in the US, we're still seeing thousands of lives lost every day. Um, and in LA specifically, Mayor Garcetti, who you know I love so much, has already extended shelter at home order until May 15th. The curve is flattening, which is what we want. And that means we all need to keep doing our part with physical distancing and staying at home if we can to make sure that that curve continues to go down. And since we're still actively fighting the spread of coronavirus, oh, one of my dogs knows how to open the door. Hold on. Come here, buddy. Yes, he knocks on the door. Come here, Bo. Actually, it'd be a good update to show everyone how much you've grown. Come here. Come here. Oh, see, much harder to pick up. This is Bo, short for Rainbow. You all remember him from a week ago, he is getting much bigger. Baby Bo is not that baby anymore. He's still my baby. Um, okay, so since we're still actively fighting the spread of coronavirus, this week I wanna focus on learning from people on the front lines. In medicine, working in communities dealing with economic loss um, and food insecurity, working with at-risk populations um, and politics and more. So Bright Minded guests this week are people who have been working hard to serve others ow, <laughs> way before this pandemic and who will continue to do so even after the pandemic when it ends. But right now they're going even beyond giving all their help to help meet the needs of our community, uh, save lives and to keep us all safe and healthy. So this week is going to be more of a Q&A type style because I really just want to like listen and learn from all of these experts and community leaders. So I have a few questions for each person. I'm really excited for all of us to get to know them better and hear firsthand about their experiences. So first, my first guest is Oscar Mitas, who's a doctor on COVID-19 unit in uh, New Orleans. So Dr. Oscar Mitas, who is, um, who is Louisiana's, who's working with Oshner Health, who's Louisiana's largest nonprofit academic healthcare system. Um, Dr. Mitas has practiced medicine since 2009, and his expertise includes internal medicine, heart failure, and clinical science. Uh, so Dr. Oscar, because I get to call him that because we're casual now, you know, we're homies. Dr. Oscar received his undergraduate and medical degrees in Venezuela and completed his internship and residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Oscar volunteered to work on one of the COVID-19 only floors at his hospital in New Orleans. And so I'm really honored to have him on the show because he is truly a healthcare hero. So let's connect Dr. Oscar. Hey. 
Hi, Miley. Hi. Yeah. It says waiting for connection. I'll wait till I can see you. All right. All righty. Uh, <laughs> it's not my show without a few technical difficulties. Hold on one second. I'm going to call you right back. Hello. Hello. I still can't see you. Can you see me? I can see you perfectly. Uh, okay. Let me make sure everyone else can uh, see you also. I'm going to check really big. Um, yes. Because I'm all good. I can do the same. It's like we're chatting on the phone. But I'm happy you can see. I was just showing my, I was just showing my puppy. This is Bo, who I adopted. Uh, I rescued him last week on the show and he has grown so much in a week. Um, it's crazy because doing the show over the last few weeks I've really been able to kind of like document him and he's just getting into his terrible twos right now so you may see him chewing on my hand and my clothes and you know as you would on a talk show with the host being used as a chew toy by her puppy hi people I think I think your audience is able to see me they're texting they're uh, actively that they can see me and then perfect that's great um okay so I wanted can you hear me now damn okay I'm gonna end and start over so much for being on Bright Minded. You're my first guest for the Hero Week, and it's just so fitting. You, I just want to thank you so much for all of your hard work, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Well, uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for your introduction, and thanks for having me on your show. I think you do an amazing uh, effort here in trying to help the community and uh, seed some awareness to everybody. I think, like you've mentioned, it's a, it's a group effort. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, it's really, um, you work just so hard, you know, oh, you're my puppy. <laughs> I love you. You work so hard all the time, not just in this pandemic, but just year round and dedicating yourself to saving lives is just incredible. And if I could use this platform to kind of highlight, oh, my dog is huge, highlight, um, you know, people doing this incredible work. Um, you know, I actually spent a lot of time in New Orleans because I filmed a movie so undercover there for a couple of months and I just made so many amazing memories. I ate so much food, so much good food. Every time I went anywhere, someone would offer me like a home cooked meal. So people were bringing like amazing food to set. I, I met so many local artists and musicians. Um, I really dove into that music scene because it's just so inspiring. I'm from Nashville, so, you know, music is like the heart of New Orleans and of Nashville. Um, there's just a lot of vibrance, so it's really devastating to see that New Orleans has been particularly hit really hard. Um, it just breaks my heart because I've so, got such a personal connection with NOLA. Yes, and Miley, the, that's the culture of NOLA. People here are very warm, and they invite you to their homes really quickly, and they, 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 they greet you with food and, and with their, their, you know, with the warmth of their home and it is a vibrant city with a lot of music and this is ha this has been affecting the whole population i mean this is a city that strives on the service industry on the on the nightlife on the music industry on on street vendors on people that are just out there serving the tourists and and all of a sudden we have this shocking situation and, and it seems to have paralyzed a little bit of that beautiful culture but you see in the people you can still see the energy in them trying to overcome this and just trying to get things better. When I told them that you were hosting this interview, they were extremely excited. I think the people of NOLA love you very much. And um, right back. I love them very much. I've had a lot of times, a lot of karaoke nights. I believe there are some photos that I wish didn't exist of me walking up and down, in and out of some of the karaoke places. It's never really fair doing karaoke with me because I just hog the mic the whole time and I turn it from like karaoke night to Miley concert night. Um, but I have some great t-shirts and I, I went to, you know, got a lot of um, handmade and, and art that I love that I, that I still um, cherish. What is something, what is, what is, what does your kind of unit look like right now? What are you mostly seeing in your unit? Uh, first, I have to tell you that the whole hospital has transformed into a COVID unit, basically. 
uh, we have uh, strictly been managing the, the sickest of the COVID patients. So in, in that, uh, having said that, the hospital kind of changed the, the appearance and what it's uh, adapted to treat these uh, critical care patients with that need ventilation. So uh, in an attempt of doing that and provide the best care for patients and minimize uh, cost contamination, minimize uh, uh, exposure to us, the providers, we uh -huh. have to kind of transpo uh, transform the appearance of the inside as well. Uh, not only mechanically and uh, logistically with hardware and, and, and devices, but also, you know, we're, we're, we walk through the hallways and this is actually a pretty refreshing time because we're using masks 12 hours a day. Um, just starting off there, we're using gowns and gloves to walk from one unit to the other. And when you're walking in the units, you're seeing every single patient, majority of these COVID patients are intubated. We've uh, developed criteria that if you need to be in the hospital, it's, it's because you're very sick, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, we send you home and we want you to stay home and quarantine yourself. So we want people to avoid getting to this point of needing to be hospitalized because once you're here, you're not seeing any more family visitors anymore. We've restricted that. So patients are alone in their room and all they have is us. And, yeah. and, and all we, all we, you know, it's, it's, it was pretty worrisome two weeks ago when this started in the front end, when all we were getting was, was the patient load that were getting admitted to this wow. and not knowing how long they were gonna need uh, support. And okay. finally, as, as they improved and by getting the help they needed, getting patients discharged out of, the, out of these uh, units has really helped the, the emotional component of us as providers. There, so basically what I'm trying to describe is initially there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of tension and stress. Mm -hmm. So the hospital also created spaces for decompression. There are, there are we rescued areas that were usually for patient visitation and our uh, meditation centers or yoga spots mm -hmm. and food you know, centers. So all dedicated to recreate the best environment so that we as providers can, can provide the care that the patient needs. So like you're saying, you know, you are kind of, you know, become the family friend and loved one because the visitors aren't allowed to come see the patients. So it's really important, I'm sure, for you to come in with good energy, even though you're going to be stressed and overworked and tired. Um, how, do you, how do you stay positive personally? You know, what inspires you to keep going and, and to walk in there with, no matter what you're feeling, that brave face because you are, you are their loved one at that time. A hundred percent. And that is one message that, that has been clear to all of us in the hospital and has been one of the inspiring elements in our efforts in, in continuing to, pro to provide the best care that we can in these times of stress when we're scared for our own safety as well, for our own health and our families. Uh, but having, having passed the curve a little bit and finally be, being able to discharge patients has become a source of, of gratification to us. So we have really put all of our efforts in trying to get our patients out of here. We do our best in trying to stay in contact, uh, communicating with their families. We do FaceTime video uh, mm -hmm. conference calls so that families can see their patients. But you've seen some amazing camaraderie, some support system that have been created here within the, the Osher community. And I think probably in, throughout hospitals all across the country, we're united in this and we have to stick together in, in order to overcome this. It's not a one man job, you know? Yeah. So now that we see patients being discharged and we are understanding that we can control, that we can manage this has become very, very satisfying. And you often hear applause and clapping when, when you're finally seeing that patient that was for 14 days in the unit with a tube down her throat now being taken, you know, discharged home. And that is a, a success of, of, of its own. And that is what inspires us. True. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned your family um, and everyone at the hospital, like not being a, being so worried about also making their family sick because you guys are around so many patients. Um, you know, how, how do you deal with that, with, you know, staying in touch with people that you love um, when I'm sure that's you're also just working so many hours? It's tough. Uh, fortunately, I have a very supportive and understanding <laughs> that I go home to every day and she is very loving and takes very good care of me and our two boys. 
uh, to whom we've had to explain why they can't jump to that when I come home. So uh, we, we've had to take this to our home and, and also be cautious at home. So what I try to do is continue to apply the measures of, of cautious use of protective gear. Mm -hmm. I do not bring any of my protective gear or my scrubs or my, any of my medical assets at home. I leave all that in the hospital. Um, and I, don't, I bring a new, a new set of shoes to my home. I mean, I, to that level of just trying to go home fresh with nothing that could potentially cross-contaminate. Mm -hmm. Once I go home, I, I, I take an immediate shower. And I'm sorry to talk about intimate. Uh, no, bit. it's, good to, it's good to know. But it's because I was even going to ask, I mean, just for me, I have all my questions written down, but sometimes in these conversations, I get a new question that I was never planning on asking. We, I talked about, you know, flattening the curve and other countries that seem to have been flattening the curve and that, you know, even in LA, we're starting to see some progress and you were just talking about that too. What, because I think we just hear these terms all the time and in the news and on social media, flattening the curve. What does that exactly mean? And how do we do that? Is that something important for me? Like if I do have to go for my essential grocery shop, you know, every other week, do I leave my shoes outside the door? Like what, what is, what is, how do you flatten the curve? What, what can we do? That's an excellent question, Miley. And I think that that, that is where all of you outside of the hospital can help. We certainly don't want to have more patients come to the hospital if they can avoid it. We certainly want people to be able to take the message that's pretty clear, stay home, use protective gear. And that is the effort. That's the only effort uh, that you need to do. We need to stop the, the, the spread of the the disease and even though many of us up to 50 percent of us can be asymptomatic um, but not only that carriers and potentially infect others what we need to do is give this a halt for enough time so that the disease by itself can then finally come down and that's why we're talking about flat curve try to minimize the, the amount of new cases try to minimize the amount of hospital admissions Try to minimize the amount of patients that need to be on a ventilator and use of resources when it could all be somewhat managed and manipulated mm -hmm. with human behavior, with prevention. And I don't want to take up too much of your time and you actually just totally answer one of my next questions, which is how do we support you? Which I guess how we support you is by doing what we're told is going to keep everyone safest and keep people out of the hospital. So you want us really taking our stay at home seriously, masks, gloves. Um, but the question that I had just hearing you talk about this, so talking about like asymptomatic and carriers, that's why it's so important for everyone. Because when people go, oh, well, I'm young or I'm healthy or I feel good, I've been home. There's a way to be a carrier or to be asymptomatic where you can infect others and not know it. Is that what I'm understanding? 100%. And unfortunately, what happens is that then we um, distribute or we basically infect the patients that are are vulnerable, the patients that have cardiac uh, risk factors. And mm -hmm. in this, I mean high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they have uh, coronary disease, they have heart failure, they have diabetes. These are the patients that we're seeing in the hospital. And these are the patients that are dying, uh, Miley. Fortunately, us that, and fortunately for the people that are healthy, uh, they can, they, they're, res you know, they're resilient, but their duty is to try to stop the spread of the disease. But also I wanna remind the people that these people that have had these coronary uh, cardiovascular risk factors are all lifestyle modifiable. So we're all, this is, should be a wake up call for all of us. We should be healthier. Right. We should, we should eat healthier. We should do more exercise. Yeah. We should, we should uh, have better lifestyle overall that can decrease our risk to having cardiac diseases. Um, but uh, in terms of what you're saying and, and what you could do also is, is that I think that you continue to continue to use protective gear. I'm seeing people saying, I, I, I stayed at home for a month, like what the heck? Uh, I think that we just have to wait until, wait, wait this off, you know, until it cools down. <laughs> My dog yeah. is telling me to let you get back to work. <laughs> um, I want to thank you so much for, I feel so much more educated just from getting this is amazing for me and for my followers and viewers to get to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation like you said a lot of us do want to stay away from the hospital or from a doctor's office if we can avoid it um and give the patients that really need it the the space so you guys can focus on who really needs it so we're not having a lot of these conversations we're not going for these 
moment so we can just talk to a doctor and get ourselves educated on what we can do. And I think mm-hmm. what I've taken away from it the most from this conversation is just continuing to remember that people can be carriers, you can have no symptoms, and you can still hurt people um, that we love. Correct. And stay, keep, I think I've heard many of the good things that you're doing. Keep on, keep on encouraging people to stay mindful, to care for their, for, we have to care for each other, uh, certainly. The, we're always going to be as weak as the weakest one of our population is. Right. The, the ones in this advantage could ultimately get sick and then get us sick and, and the other end of the equation. So care for, for each other, care for the elder, donate food to, to whoever needs one. Ask your elder if they need for you to do groceries for them. If they are a home of several, of several family members, pick one to do the groceries and then just try to minimize the exposure time and try to be really careful what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything that you do all the time, not just now, but especially right now. Um, and thank you for being on Bright Minded. You're the man. Thank you, Dr. Oscar. You're very welcome. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing one of your uh, face masks. I would love to wear one in the hospital. I actually painted, I will send you some pictures. I painted um, this weekend. I had gotten some of my masks. Jeremy Scott had an idea of repurposing some old scarves, turning them into masks so you could make more than one. So it's great. I made a Gucci one. I'm all about it. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see Bye. You. That was amazing i the entire time i kept feeling like my eyes just started to water because you can just tell that these doctors um, and these healthcare workers are just like totally exhausting themselves and working so hard to keep us all safe and healthy so just super super inspiring um to talk to another amazing doctor we're going to talk to Syra madad um that's our next guest dr Syra madad who is a nationally recognized leader in public health and special pathogen preparedness and response she is the senior director for new york city health and hospitals special pathogens program and you may also recognize her from the 2020 netflix docuseries pandemic how to prevent an outbreak so in addition to being a badass public health leader, she's also a mom of three kids. She's been helping lead NYC's response to the pandemic, coordinating the efforts to expand capacity for COVID-19 patients, like working with local hotels to convert them for patients, for example. So this is an honor to connect to this next year. So let's do it. While we wait, here, come here, buddy, right here. If you notice, I washed my hair, which um, I realized I had not washed my hair since Elton John. I never thought that would be a sentence that came out of my mouth. Oh, I haven't uh, washed my hair since Elton John, which was like 10 days ago. Yes. Dr. Madan is joining. Okay. Syra Madan, connecting now. Hi. Hi, how are you? So good to see you on the screen. This has just been such an amazing beginning for our Heroes Week. I just had an amazing conversation. Um, with Dr. Oscar in New Orleans, and now getting to hear from you in New York. I wore one of my favorite New Yorkers, Debbie Harry, uh, oh. just for you. 
Thank you. <laughs> I love it. There's such a magic of the city. Uh, I've got to spend so much time there and um, just so much history and so many iconic um, artists from New York. So it's just devastating to know that it's being uh, hit so hard with this, um, with COVID-19. So I'm just really happy to get to spend a little bit of time with you. And I'm just honored to talk to a woman who shows us that we can really have it all and do it all of balancing your passion and your dreams and taking care of people, but also be an awesome mom. I watched um, Pandemic on Netflix. And so I was just super inspired by you and how you balance that. And I have a feeling that it could be even more challenging in a time like this. How is that balancing being a mom at this time and, and the stress that you're under? Well, and first, you know, thank you for obviously all the comments you made. I think for, for me right now, it's the, one of the most exhausting periods of my life, but it's also one of the moments where I'm extremely proud of everything that's going on behind the scenes with healthcare workers and, you know, the amazing fight that they're fighting in combating COVID-19. Uh, you know, I have three children. I actually um, had a baby. Uh, she's actually 12 weeks today. So she's my pandemic baby. I actually delivered her six weeks before the first uh, case of 19 hit New York. And then um, a week after I delivered her, I went, right, right, went back to work because we knew that this was something that's going to impact New York City and New York State, given that it's a melting pot, given how, uh, you know, it's the international hub we have in New York City, you know, over 8 million people. And we knew this is something to care for. So, you know, my, my family and my kids have been very supportive, but it's certainly obviously a very scary time for everybody. Wow. I don't even I could not even imagine that's just so I mean I'm just so inspired by you of like your dedication um and I feel very taken care of knowing that you and people like you exist you know for people like me and keeping everyone safe and healthy and just knowing that you're there makes all of us be able to just feel more protected but it's still just a you know a really terrifying um, time for everyone. I wanted to ask you, how do you stay inspired? You know, is it your family? How do you stay encouraged? Um, and then what would you tell other fellow healthcare workers that may be watching now that are struggling during this time? How do you do it? How do you stay light? It's definitely uh, very difficult. And this is probably the, you know, biggest marathon of our, all of our lives, you know, not just for those that are healthcare workers, those that are on the front lines behind the scenes, but even, you know, just the general public, you know, we, uh, you know, the United States hit a huge milestone where all 50 states are under a declaration of, of disaster, if you will, you know, everyone else is sheltering in place, social distancing, staying home, nothing like this has ever been seen before in US history. And so this is, you know, a team effort. From a healthcare perspective, it takes a village to respond to this type of incident. It's not obviously a one-person team or, a, or you know a one-man show. It really takes an entire village, an entire healthcare system to respond to this growing epidemic. Uh, you're seeing in New York City that you know the number of beds that we're trying to continue to add uh, for the potential ongoing surge of patients. Each one of those beds that's coming online in the, in, in the hours to come, the days to come, represents a courageous healthcare worker that's going to be taking care of, you know, a patient in that bed. And so this is something where we all need to come together as one, not just as one government, but as one society, because we're all in it together, and every one of us plays a part in this uh, pandemic. You know, I, I, I always get to, some people always ask me, you know, what can I do, you know, um, as just a general person, I'm not a physician, I'm not a, you know, a nurse, but in order for us to get to the post, you know, COVID uh, America that we're trying to get back to our normal life, there's really two main things that all of us really need to do. And the first is we need to continue to abide by these social distancing measures. We need to continue to change our behavior. So these everyday measures that you see public health workers constantly harp on, washing your hands, covering your cough, staying home, things like that. Those, those are the things that are actually flattening the curve. So I'm sure everyone has heard about flying the curve so many times, but that's what it's doing. But the other aspect is, you know, staying informed and going, going to credible sources. There's so much misinformation out there. And even my own family member, you know, they're, they're constantly texting me of, you know, uh, do you think this, uh, this remedy works or, and should I do this? It's completely not based on science. 
So this is a time for science to speak. This is a time for people to really, you know, listen to those that are in the field to get their advice and to make sure that they're following through. So we talk a lot about reliable sources on this show. We've talked about, you know, reliable source can also be just, you know, your, you know, in reliable sources, when I kind of talked about it for my kind of fans have been, you know, not gossipy text chains, not social media, not random tweets. Um, you know, not family members or your drama loving friend that loves to send you every clickbait interview. Be very protective of yourself um, and the information that you put in because our thoughts determine how we're going to feel. So anxious, um, you know, misleading, clickbaity information makes us all feel panicked. And, you know, for me, I know that a lot of my anxiety can actually cause things that could be mistaken as symptoms like shortness of breath from holding my breath um, and then completely putting myself into an anxious spiral. And it's really important that healthy people stay out of the hospitals. And so those that are really affected can get the treatment and attention because, you know, anyone in the hospital that shouldn't or couldn't be there one, right? You're, you're exposing yourself to those who are sick. Um, but also you're taking away the attention from those that really, really need it. So it's really important that the healthy um, or asymptomatic, right, stay home and isolated rather than causing anxiety or fear that can anxiety attacks can bring on some of those, sim those symptoms and make you feel like you need to go to the hospital. And it's really important that what, what, would, like, what would you say to, what are the symptoms that would, make you want to go to the hospital what what would and what makes you stay at home where's the line so and, and that's a great question because with COVID-19 it's a very large spectrum of illness a lot of people you know either they are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic or either they have a mild version of the disease or they have a very severe critical version so you know a lot of people fall under those different buckets but in terms of when to see a healthcare provider if you don't you know get better with 24 to 48 hours, certainly make sure that, you know, you call your healthcare provider. But really one of the key symptoms is if you start to experience that shortness of breath, it's really time for you to, to uh, you know, get medical help right away. Um, and that's very important because what you're seeing, at least here in, you know, New York State, New York City, the number of people that are dying in their home has, you know, quadrupled. Uh, usually you see on any given day before COVID, you know, a handful of uh, people dying in homes over 20. We're seeing 200 people now, majority obviously related to COVID. So make sure that you seek healthcare services if you need to. But I think another important concept is everybody understands first line of defense, second line of defense, third line of defense. Our first line of defense is our everyday measures, our social distancing. If we're able to stay home, if we're able to, you know, cover our costs, stay healthy, that should be our first line of defense. Our second line of defense is to see a healthcare provider, a hospital, we're going to be here for you. We're going to treat every single patient that walks into our doors and give it our all. We're going to give the same, uh, you know, type of care uh, to every single patient, regardless of your ability to pay, your immigration status, uh, you know, uh, your racial profile. And it doesn't, none of that matters. We're going to give the, the best care possible. But at the same time, knowing that we're in a crisis situation, this is something that we have never experienced before. Hospitals are getting overwhelmed not something that we're going to do. Uh, we're in a crisis care type of environment. And so while you're going to get that great care, at the same time, we want to make sure you're staying out of the hospital if you don't need to go to a hospital so other people that actually need it uh, are going there. You know, a lot of people also, it's hard for them to kind of get into the thinking of, well, you know, I'm healthy. I don't feel, you know, that I have COVID. Um, I can just go out to the grocery store um, and, and kind of do what I need to do. But it's really, it's not about you. And the reason why I say that, it's about the new chains of, of uh, infections that you create. So you may not even know about it. You may, you may be a carrier and you go out to the grocery store and unfortunately you have other people there that may not be you know, keeping that social distancing of six feet and they're in the aisle and they, you, know, you go ahead and you infect them by you know, the means of transmission. They then go home and then they can infect their grandma, their children, and then that starts off a whole new chain of transmission. And what we know about this virus is Every one person that gets infected can infect at least, you know, two to three more people. So you're going to double that, then quadruple that, you know, and that's how these new chains of transmission start. So, you know, that's why we say it's not about you. You can, you can infect other people without even knowing it. I was thinking a lot about, you know, I'm someone um, that I'm very, like, 
I love people and I love meeting new people. I love talking to people. So this has been really challenging for me who just loves to connect. So that's why I created this digital platform so I can still do it. I can still feel like I can give you a hug and thank you without touching or putting you at risk. So there's just been a lot of ways that I've been trying to get creative that I feel like I could still make an impact on someone without having to get near them or put them at risk in any way. So one thing that I've been doing is like wearing really funny shirts that say funny things or have funny pictures on them to the grocery store. Cause it feels really weird to, we're not used to this society where like I'm supposed to keep my distance or not hold the door for someone, or it just feels, it's really hard to retrain yourself of what's appropriate. Um, and you know, like even when I have done my essential shopping, which I try to keep to a minimum, it's like, you almost really have to continue to remind yourself or write it down, write it down somewhere to say, make sure you're keeping your distance or whatever you need to do. Because I feel like that's been the hardest thing for me to stay uh, consistently reminded of is the actual distancing when I do have to do my essential outings. Yeah. And and you're certainly not alone. I think, you know, uh, a lot of us are, you know, uh, are in that social environment or, you know, that person type, uh, you know, uh, structure. Um, it's very hard, but you know, this is where I think once we overcome COVID-19, and we are, where there's going to be a light at the end of the tel tunnel, this is not something that's going to go on forever. Um, but in order for this to be done faster, it takes all of us. It's not just the government that knows these measures, but all of us play a role. Um, but I think what's, what we're going to see is after this is all done with, is people are probably going to be very reluctant to shake hands, you know, hugging each other, uh, because they're going to remember what an infectious diseases do. So this is obviously just one infectious disease. Seasonal flu is something we see every year. Um, and it spreads very similarly through the respiratory route. Um, you know, people coming in close contact with one another. But I think generally what's probably going to happen is people are more reluctant and in, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, making those close contacts, um, which, you know, it's, it's kind of a double edged sword. So one of those things. Yeah, it's tough too, because these little changes, you know, they'll be probably easy. Once this does go back to normal, we go back to normal, those will start to fade out and it'll feel like you want to creep into what you've been known to do, which is hi, nice to meet you. I mean, I, I think a reason why um, it's very uncomfortable for me because I do a lot of meet and greets before I do a show and I always want to hug my fans and shake my fans hand, but then I can't continue to do my job if I do get sick and then I'm shaking a minute, you know, all these hands and hugging all these people. So I think it's a, like you said, it's a really good lesson um, that we're going to learn to take into our non COVID world that we need to just protect ourselves because I think this is a really good wake up call of, you know, trying to, we can connect without putting each other at risk of getting each other sick. That's right. That's, that's right. the other thing that this virus is actually doing is besides, you know, the effect it's having people and the health and, and hospitals, you know, it's actually, you know, revealing the gaps and the weaknesses in our society in America. So you're probably seeing, you know, in the headlines um, of people that uh, obviously are at higher risk of getting COVID-19, not just those with underlying health conditions and Unfortunately, in America, a lot of people have underlying health conditions, even obesity. We obviously have an obesity epidemic here. And this is a time for people to really look at themselves and see, I need to get myself in better shape, my health into better shape. Um, because it's not just COVID-19, it's everything else that's down the line that can affect me. But some of the other things that it's, that it's revealing, you know, in, in America is those that don't have insurance or that are underinsured, have lack of um, access to health care services, those that actually work in jobs and don't have paid sick leave because they're forced to now go to work because they need to put food on the table and they're exposing themselves and their loved ones um, and these health disparities uh, inequalities that we're seeing so it's actually revealing all of these underlying health conditions that we're seeing in america and one of the things i really hope that comes out of this whole pandemic is that we are you know able to actually work on some of these underlying issues um, and make america a better place for everybody yeah, so, so really staying more aware of our diets, um, what we're putting inside of our bodies, things that we can do to boost our immune system all year instead of now. It's so funny, like, you know, some of the natural health food places, it's all the things that we should really be taking daily at the very front of the counter because it's like, well, these are all things. Um, oh, it's pausing. Let me see. Oh, I think you're back. Let's see. Oh, yeah. All things that I, you know, that I know... Um, like even turmeric is something that I love that I kind of take all year. So just things that we can do to keep our immune systems healthy. So that's important all the time. I think, you know, we've talked a lot about on the show about 
going back to the pre-COVID-19 world, but that's not really the world we want to go back to. We want to go back to the healthier, more um, connected, but safely, you know, and, and also I think this has made us appreciate people in our lives that we don't always tell them. Like, you know, I've had all the time to go visit my grandma who's in senior living and now I can't. And now I have this burning urge and desire to like go and hug my grandma, but I've had all this time to get to go visit her. And so I think it just puts a lot of things into perspective and, um, you know, I think it's important, like you just said, we don't want to go back to the pre-COVID world. We want to go to a new world that we've learned a really valuable lesson from this and that we can use in our life to prevent, right? That's right, exactly. Unfortunately, you know, this shouldn't have been our wake-up call. We've had so many instances that we've had these, you know, notions of wake-up call, like, you know, Ebola 2014, H1N1 in 2000, uh, you know, 2009, and, and we've had so, and Zika um, and all these other types of infections, these outbreaks, those were all of our wake-up calls. But unfortunately, you know, we didn't invest in the public health structure that we could have at that time. And had we done so, we probably would have, been in a much different place that we are today. So we need to continue to have that political will, that financial support um, of talking about public health and health care security. And not just for the United States, because one of the things that another great lesson learned is we're not in this alone, you know. Um, an outbreak that can start in a small, small Africa can reach all continents in a matter of 36 hours. So we need to help um, other countries besides the United States and for the healthcare infrastructure because it just takes that one plane ride, right? For it to come to the United States and it just takes that one person from an outbreak. So we wanna make sure that we are investing in global health security. Everybody needs to make sure that we have good health systems in place and people can access these healthcare systems. So that's very important. Yeah, so I wanted to actually ask you, um, you know, what, what does really make this different? Actually, one of my questions, it's just perfect. We're like leading into it so perfect. You're answering so many things that I had. You know, a lot of people are wondering, if life will go back to normal. And you said this is not forever. I think that gives us a lot of peace of heart to hear you say that. Um, what is your advice like on timing and on the pace of this virus in, in the US and worldwide, since you mentioned that, that this is something that this is not just focused in the States, but worldwide? Yeah, so unfortunately this past week in the US entered a, a very grim milestone where we have, you know, one of the most um, highest number of cases of COVID in, in the world. Um, you know, based on what we've seen around the world, it's probably going to take, the amount of time it took for us to reach our peak, it's probably going to take twice that same amount of time for us to actually come down from that peak. But it also uh, depends on having that infrastructure in place in the United States. So we've probably heard a lot about testing and monitoring. Um, and having a lot of those aggressive approaches. We don't actually have that yet. And so in order for us to have kind of that post-COVID era, we need to make sure that, you know, our governments and our public health uh, institutions actually have the manpower to actually go in and do individual case-by-case -case, uh, contact tracing. And so right now, the measures we have in place is kind of a whole community approach. We put an entire community, you know, under lockdown, if you will, and shelter in place. But in order for us to start to put off the pedal, we need to make sure we have an infrastructure in place where we're able to monitor patients, uh, the individuals that actually have COVID, and then be able to isolate them, do contact tracing. And, and unfortunately, that's not an that's not we have yet. So we need to invest in that. Right. Um, you know, this actually brings me to my next question that I watched um, Pandemic, um, How to Prevent an Outbreak on Netflix. Um, before all of this, and you you were talking then about the importance of public health and prevention. Um, what do you want to see change so we can be better prepared in the future and not have tragic loss of life and um, you know what's the, and a massive impact on our healthcare system? What would you like to see? Absolutely, and and that's the million dollar question. Uh, but I would see is that we invest in preparedness because I'm sure everybody knows of you know this this quote is you know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know mm -hmm. that is so true because if we invest in preparedness um, it's really a fraction of the consequence that we're facing today and the consequence is not just the lives lost which is enormous but it also has an impact on our behavioral health has an impact on our economy um, and so if we actually uh, you know invest in preparedness and when I say invest in preparedness you know making sure that we have a public health care infrastructure and health care delivery infrastructure unfortunately both of these two sectors have been taking 
a huge uh, cut uh, for many, many years. And at the local level, this is where rubber meets the road. And so if we want to make sure we have a healthy community, we want to make sure that we're able to respond better, faster, and more efficiently for the next outbreak, which is inevitable. We're going to have another outbreak of whatever on the horizon, we need to make sure we are preparing for it today, investing for it today. So we need to continue to have, you know, these talks. And unfortunately, one of the things that happens at the governmental uh, kind of uh, level is that we have this injection approach. We, you know, we have all this pot of money that goes into the response for COVID. And that once COVID is done, we take that money away, we take that expertise away, we take that staffing away, and then we're not preparing for the future outbreak. So we need to really prepare for like for this outbreak or for infection outbreaks that we prepare for war. You know, you have a reserve of military on hand, you have money, you have weapons. We need to prepare for, in fact, just like we, we, we prepare for war. Thank you so much for your time. I feel like that was something that was really helpful for me also, just staying prepared. I don't think I realize that we put all, all it's like anything, you put the focus when it's happening, but it's very easy to forget when things do go back to normal. And we have to know that, I like what you said about this is like preparing, you'd like you would prepare for anything else or for war. Um, and I think that just makes us be aware of how important that our votes are, um, how important us as the general public, how much change we can really make by, by, our, our, uh, by our vote and um, by continuing to just stay involved and stay aware. And, and when this is all over and goes back to normal, that it's important to stay alert and um, to try to keep everyone safe so we can avoid something like this. Again, and like you said, if we can't, if that is inevitable, how are we preparing and how are we demanding um, that our states stay prepared? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We cannot um, place in. That would be the biggest downfall of us all. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for caring uh, for everyone and for New York. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time because I know this is incredibly stressful and I'm sure you're exhausted, but just being able to talk to um, everyone that's watching, but a lot of my fans are a younger generation um, and we're very passionate about what we can do. You know, this next generation is super, super involved and passionate. All we want is the information. And you tell us, you know, someone like you tells us to jump and we'll go, how high, what do we have to do? How do we avoid our parents, our grandparents, our friends that are being compromised or ourselves being at risk? We really want to make a difference. A lot of us, myself included, just don't know where to start. So you telling us what the starting line is and what we can do and um, how we, we want to be needed. We want to do what's right. We just don't know where to begin. So thank you. No, thank you. And thank you for highlighting this very important. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. Um, like this, who are selfless and talented in the future and, and not to have this tragic loss um, of lives. Oh, it's frozen. Um, and I know that there are so many people around us, friends, parents, neighbors who are stepping up during this time and going above and beyond to help on the front lines or behind the scenes too. So that's why I want to hear from you, whether it's working as a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, in a grocery store, doing deliveries, organizing donations, uh, sewing DIY masks, helping your neighbors. Um, I want to know who is a hero to you and who you would like to highlight. So every day this week, I'm going to be starting the show, sharing some submissions, uh, share on Twitter, on Instagram, tag me, um, use the hashtag highlighting heroes. We all know someone who is a hero. And so I'm just excited to see who you send in and I'll see you again tomorrow. Same time, same place, bright-minded, live with Miley. See you then.